I walked up next to him and I said, Mike, say these words. I can, I will, I can, I will, I can, I will. Repeat it 10 times. And he did that. The next day, he walked up to the log and did it twice. Nobody else lifted it. Hmm. Mike Jenkins believed he could do it. It comes down to conceive, believe, and achieve. Where you pick a goal short term or long, you develop a plan to get into the, to get to that goal. You must believe in the plan, believe in the goal, believe in yourself. And the achievement's really kind of simple. It's execution you know. at that point, right? <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Lionheart Radio with your host, Rick Alexander. Today I'm talking with three-time world's strongest man, legend in the sport of strength, Bill Kazmaier. Bill, thanks for being on. Oh, you're very welcome. I look forward to talking to some of your fans. I know you have uh, tens of thousands of them. It's That's pretty, right. It's pretty neat to, That's right. to be able to belt across the airwaves to them and maybe fill them in on a little bit of strength and history and what we've been doing and where we're going and all. Yeah, yeah. And this is a cool uh, medium because people in, I know you do a lot of travel, you, you're still very involved in the sport, you headline a lot of strongman stuff. You do MCs for uh, you do the MC gig for Giants Live. And that brings you must bring you all over Europe. It surely does. Our next one's going to be in a couple of weeks in Indianapolis, Indiana, and there's a pretty good field there of, of big guys, and it's it's going to be a lot of fun. It really is, and it goes with a package of six different shows this year uh, to 45 different countries. Wow! So Darren Sadler and Colin Bryce have done a remarkable job. In not only running the shows and filling stadiums, but also in putting a quality product on the airwaves uh, almost immediately rather than having to wait for World's Strongest Man yeah. for six months to watch the show. Sure. So there is a need, and they're filling it, and there's a lot of rising stars coming up and doing great. Yeah, yeah, and that's the beauty of uh, social media, right? Like the sport has really, it seems to me, the sport has seen a pretty big expansion in the last decade or so because, you know, they're starting Strongman and all these new kind of pages. It's, it, a lot of ways to get people involved, it seems like, that it, didn't used to be around. It really sure seems that way. You know, you've got the beast, Eddie Hall, after doing the 500-kilo deadlift. Uh, he was instantly famous. And I'm not sure what his following is, but after winning World's Strongest Man, he's working on acting and literally traveling all over the world. He's going to have a big show in Dubai, and I believe he'll be the referee there, hmm. inviting the top guys for sure. A guy like Hafthor Bjornsson. Told Mountain. me, yeah, he says he calls me Mr. Kazmaier, and he has a lot of respect. He calls, says Sir when he talks to me. He has a million followers on Instagram. Yeah, and he posts sometimes a couple times a day. Where I guess that's the key. But he's sort of figured it out as to just exactly when to post, because sometimes I'll be in the U.S. posting something uh, in the evening where it's two in the morning in the U.K. and, and you get very few likes or right. responses. So. I'm, I'm a little older and trying to figure out all that stuff, but it's a lot of fun to be able to have those airwaves and stuff like this to be able to talk to so many people. Right. Yeah, and, and one of the things he did, of course, he was on Game of Thrones, and that got him, you know, mainstream mainstream attention for sure. Um, but so if we could think back to the 80s then, and we think back to your kind of dominant reign in the sport, what has it been like since you've stayed involved with the sport for so long? How has that transition been? Like, what, what what's big to you that's so much different now than than what it was when you were there. It surely is nice to be able to be involved and be relevant here in 2018 when it's literally 40 years ago that the competition had just started. And I was so enamored when I first got going because in 79, the third year being my first, I went up against Don Reinhardt in the car deadlift and I pulled 900 and it was hard. He pulled it, it was equally hard. Then they raised the weight to 960 and I pulled it was really hard and Don raised his hand in a salute and said if he wants it that bad he can have it so to start then and make my mentor my uh, the hero the the greatest the powerlifting world champion four times and and world's strongest man to make him quit in an event when he held the world record deadlift yeah was a pretty cool feeling and the sport has evolved from then to now where the guys some of the guys say that we're a lot stronger now yeah what by 100 pounds and you weigh 100 pounds more, I'm not mm. sure how much stronger they really are. But the sport has evolved in a way where all we did was get strong, come from our individual sport, 
and bring it to World's Strongest Man. And with the advent of a young athlete from Finland called Yoko Hola in 97, he only did one lift in the gym, which was deadlift. Everything else was event training. So he pretty much revolutionized and changed the sport of strongman and was the first one to do that. And since then, 20 more years, obviously the sport really has evolved. Right. The weights are a little heavier. And some of the medleys are a little more complex. When you're ambidextrous with a big dumbbell, a circus dumbbell that's over 200 pounds on its way to 300 and are going for reps in a 60-second time limit, it becomes a pretty interesting event. Right. For us back in the day, one rep would have been great. As a matter of fact, the first time I saw the Thomas Inch dumbbell, I became the fifth man in history to pick it off the ground and stand up with it. That was a Herculean effort. Sure. When I said, watch this, I'm going to put it overhead, they said, you're crazy, there's no way. And I did and proceeded to do that with one hand to be the first to ever press the Thomas Inch dumbbell. Now the boys could do, in 60 seconds, ambidextrous, probably 12, 15 reps with it. Yeah, what do you attribute that to? What Do you, do you think it's uh, changing practice. tactics? Yeah, practice and familiarity and, and some training. And You know, nowadays, the big circus dumbbells are so big on the handle, the wrist is hardly involved. The Half of the bell sets on the shoulder where it's so high, it's, the handle is above the head. Right. So it's really just control and a bit of a launch with the legs and being able to hold it and lock it out mm -hmm. and uh, get a down signal. So it's a tough lift, but it's one that's an acquired talent. Right. And each and every one of these events has changed in a way where if you're practicing enough and familiar enough and strong and fast enough, you can probably win. But then there's the manipulation of the events as to what do they want? Speed, medium weight, uh, lightweight, long distances. Right. Until uh, somebody dies or pukes or turns green. Or do they want something static where nobody's moving at all except lifting a really heavy weight? So... It's nice when it's a combination and a combination of, of, of all those together and who is the world's strongest and the fastest all at the same time, but it never seems to work out that way. It always seems to favor somebody. Hmm. And that's hard, too, because, I mean, whoever's making the event selection, how do you not favor? I mean, events are, are going to come up in people's wheelhouse, right? Yeah, without a doubt. One of my favorite years was when uh, Puts Putsakuski, what was his name? Put, 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 the Polish guy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, everybody has a lot of respect for him because I love him so much. And he's such a wonderful guy. In 06, when Phil Pfister went against him, it was a really beautiful occasion and event. Although it was raining in China, in the prelims, Phil Pfister totally botched the car carry. I think he was sandbagging. Hmm. Because in the finals, he smoked Pooj. He actually beat him five out of seven events. The last event was the most interesting in that all he had to do was beat putts in the in the stone lifting. And if he would do that in the loading event, he would win. Mm. So right before the event, it was kind of interesting. He was walking around in a field, and there was rain. He seemed to be mumbling or talking to somebody, but there was nobody near him. Yeah, He had his hands sticking up in the air as if he was pointing towards the clouds. And right where he was pointing, the sunshine had broken through the clouds it was shining right on him. It was actually quite a mystical moment. And I was screaming at him and coaching him and helping him all the way through the event. He pushed Pujanowski so far on his pace in the stones that in the final stone, Putz missed the hole and Phil Fister won to become the strongest man in the history of the world. Mm. Because if you can beat the five-pound champion, the five-time champion... Uh, five out of seven events? Right. You're the best. Right. And maybe the best ever. Right. So we might not have the record of Zadrunas and uh, some of the other guys with John Paul Sigmarsson's four times and Magnus Verz four times, Brian Shaw four, Zadrunas four. Fister with only one, but he beat the guy that won five times. So uh, right. he's high on my list to be the strongest ever. Wow. Okay. And, and it seems like he, I mean, he overcame a lot of these workouts being in Fuji's wheelhouse, right? Without a doubt, yeah, he, but he just sucked it up. Thing. and He really wasn't that muscular a guy, but big hands, extremely strong, intelligent, mm -hmm. a lot of drive. The kind of components and things that it takes to be uh, on top of the world. Yeah, right. So something something I think for the audience to think about is when you were doing this circus dumbbell, jacking it overhead, that was that was essentially brute strength, right? Because now we've refined the techniques and... and you can get a lot stronger with technique. You've not necessarily gotten stronger, but you've moved more weight, right? And it right. seems like that's really been the case. Well, I started lifting heavy dumbbells overhead and I ended up breaking the world record at 
150 for 10, 165 for 5. And then I took a single with a 1 inch bar and took it at 220, then 240, then 260. The record was 270. I was going to go 280. But I was doing really heavy dips at the time with two 100 pound dumbbells and I weighed about 330. Hmm. I was hurting my tricep and the tendon was really bothering me. And I went in the ring wrestling for WCW. And I pressed a guy over my head, and he didn't help the way he was supposed to. Yeah. And he was lopsided like some of our logs. And my tricep came off. So what do you do when that happens? I wrestled two more days and said, yeah, my tricep's really hurting, and I'm in trouble. My doc said, yeah, you're in trouble uh, with the MRI. You've ripped, you've ruptured it and torn it off. So I stopped everything, and he put it in a cast. I came out of the cast, and at the eight-week point after the surgery, I went to the Muscle Power Classic against Hilti Arnerson, Mark Higgins, John Paul Samerson, Jeff Capes, and uh, Jamie Reeves. I beat them all. Mm -hmm. And literally, it was like a World Strongest Man competition. That's eight weeks after surgery. At the 12-week point, I put a 242-pound log over my head 38 times in a row. Mm -hmm. 12 weeks. 12 weeks post At 16, I probably should have been pressing a 25-pound dumbbell. Yeah. Four months out, maybe a 50. Well, I did the world record in the log press. And people today on the internet say, well, our juniors are using that kind of weight now. Kazmaier wasn't very strong. <laughs> and blow your tricep off and try to break the world record. Uh, 16 weeks later, it just it's kind of doesn't happen. But yeah. Lots of fun with the events, lots of changes, lots lots of uh, challenges, and still around it today. It's a lot of fun. Right. What do you think growing up? I mean, clearly, naturally, you're just, you're an animal, and I, I've been lucky enough to hang out with you all weekend, right? But for the audience that's listening to this, someone that's had such a prolific strength career, would you, do you attribute anything when you were younger, anything you did to, to get you to where you are? Do you think naturally you were just, you were born for this? Well, I was a German, Ketzmeyer and Steinhoff and pretty blocky compared to all the other kids. At 10 years old, I could press my own body weight overhead at 110 pounds. I had the, I beat everybody in the track meet at a week or two before that. In the 100 and the 400 and in the 50, a couple of these kids that were, had flunked twice beat me off the line, and I took second in the 50. Uh, so I was always big and strong mm. growing up. And in junior high school, um, first year of high school as a freshman I weighed about 205 I could press that over my head five times and I didn't really do any training so I was just always strong growing up yeah because that's uh, no technique right I mean at that point you're just jacking it overhead so through that age though 10 12 14 I met a man who became a mentor a teacher the greatest strength coach I ever met really he took me in the woods and just abused me he cut down trees and made me drag them out yeah. He cut logs and made me carry them to the truck. He cut the stump, and I rolled it to the truck and pressed it over the sideboards and loaded the truck with brush and trees. And when we got to the dump, I thought, okay, push in the clutch, pull out the plunger, and let's dump this thing. I go home, my, my ass hurts. Right. All that abuse. Yeah. And instead, he said, get out and dig out the rakings, dig out the stumps, dig to the bottom and get them both exposed because we're going to pull on those two big branches you put on first. I'm going, shit, I am the dump. We're yeah. at the dump, and I'm <laughs> in the dumps. But I got a guy that's just making me work really hard, telling me, if you think it's heavy, it is. Okay, good lesson. If you say you like it, you do. If you say you're good at it, you are. Mm. He made me run back and forth in the truck, and he got me in such fantastic shape that when I made it into junior high school, I'm the fastest guy around. I'm the strongest. As a sophomore, I became a fullback after taking the ball out of a kid's hands as a freshman going 75 yards the other way. We were 5-0 and as freshman, 10-0 and as a sophomore. Mm. We never lost a conference game. And our biggest lineman was 190 pounds. I was 222 in the backfield and had the school record in the shot put in the 100-yard dash Damn. and the school res- record in the 600. So I had some pretty good endurance, too. But mm. Yeah, I guess genetics, uh, maybe attitude, aptitude, um, you know, wanting to do something enough. I was always told I would be horseshit, nothing else but. So the negative reinforcement really did kind of bolster my. Like my that push. worked for you. That was like. Oh yeah. Tell me I can't do something and I'm fucking. Whatever it is, I'll just obliterate it. Okay. And so 
you know, you try that with some people nowadays and it doesn't work at all. Mm. They want it. My son said, Dad, don't do that. Pat me on the back. Tell me how good or great I am. Give me a trophy uh, and I'll do really good. I'll do my best. He's done so well in his life and he said, Dad, you know, I learned a lot from you. I learned that anything worth having is worth working for. Hmm. That if I don't put in the effort, I'm not going to get anything back from it. That my perception of my reality is my reality and if I tell myself I'm good, then I am. And he's mastered so many things and done so well in life and sport. He said, hey, Dad, the things I learned in sport I carry over to uh, scholastics and vice versa. And he's conquering the world, which is really cool. That's awesome. Because I helped him to grow up. And I did tell him it was great. And I did encourage him. And I did help him think outside the box. I told him, if you want to predict the future, look at the past. It's cyclic. Hmm. And if you want to be part of the future, create it. And now he's 32 years old soon, and about he's doing that in the world. And it, it came from the lessons I learned in sport, and I'm happy to have helped him and mentor guys like O.D. Wilson, Jamie Reeves. Uh, now Hafler asked me for help. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Jerry Pritchett, when he was deadlifting, <clears throat> I gave him a ton of encouragement. And I got him to believe that he could do it. I think we were, uh, we were at the Arnold Classic a few years back. Mike, Mike, Mike died. Mike, the... Uh, Mike, the big 400 pound football player. Yeah. Mike uh, Jenkins. Jenkins. Mike Jenkins. That's right. Thank you. I have brain farts because I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and Mike's gone, and I really miss the guy. And sometimes when I put him out of my head, I put his, his name out of my head, too. Hmm. We were standing in front of the colossal log. It weighs 450 pounds. The oak, Austrian oak, whatever they wanted to call it. And there were two logs, a smaller one, maybe 380 or something, than the big one. He looked at it. He didn't touch either of the logs the night before in the orientation. I walked up next to him, and I said, Mike, say these words. I can, I will, I can, I will, I can, I will. Repeat it ten times, and he did that. The next day, he walked up to the log and did it twice. Nobody else lifted it. Hmm. Mike Jenkins believed he could do it. It comes down to conceive, believe, and achieve. Will you pick a goal short term or long? You develop a plan to get into the, to get to that goal. You must believe in the plan, believe in the goal, believe in yourself. The achievement's really kind of simple. It's execution you know, at that point, right? Yeah, it's uh, you know keep it simple, keep it stupid, have some desire, determination, dedication, consistency, and a little bit of hard work, and you can pretty much do you know more than you realize you can. Hmm. I think people's capacity for work is far greater than they know it is. Their strength is far greater. But we're uh, maybe held back a little bit by other people around us who uh, don't want us to succeed or don't believe uh, that humanity is as as great as it really is. And Mm. so there's some visual and uh, mental cues around us, I think, that that draws us down, that holds us back. And I think that if a person can shed some of that stuff and really look forward and just say, I can do this, they can. So those are our our ideals that are a little bit old school, a little bit foreign for today's culture, for sure. When you're going around and, you know, we listened to you talk at uh, Blackbridge Barbell yesterday, one of the things I, I picked up on instantly was how big you were hitting on the mindset piece. And how has that been in today's world? Has, I, I know you're doing this all over the world. Your travel schedule is crazy. How has that... Um, how have they how have they perceived your your message now? Do, are people eager for this? Do you think or are people? Well, eager? sure. When we were at the Barbell Club yesterday, Ryan was, you know, he's the kind of coach where he's got a steel toed shoe. Yeah. He's gonna pull, prod, push, kick you in the ass, and get the most out of you, and, and teach you the right way on all the techniques. Yeah. And with the apparatus to become a better strongman, he's probably gonna focus on core with all the guys, because he knows how important squat, deadlift, overhead, and and chest and shoulder and arm strength is um, so in all of that though the mindset has to be one where you truly are a champion if you walk the walk and talk the talk and train hard and give it your very best you can probably become an overcomer hmm. uh, if you strive to be victorious it'll all come but really I don't know I tapped into something a little bit different you know I, I simply put my hands together my head down in a YMCA and, and said make me the best hmm. and he did so with that, I tapped into a supernatural power and was given superhuman strength through the power of prayer. Sure. So for me, that works. If other people can find their path on their quest, that'll work for them. But, you know, we all have to climb the mountain. And if we watch the movie Everest and we see what it takes to climb a mountain as a white guy, yeah. 
it's pretty incredible when the Sherpa's doing it a hundred times, but you don't talk about him. Right. But the white guy who struggles and the Sherpa carries all of his food, supplies, uh, clothing, oxygen, and he makes it to the top of the mountain. Uh, he puts his flag up there. Yeah. And there's no ladder, so that's the highest mountain he's gonna ever going to get to, and that was his quest. And he did it. You know, for myself to climb that mountain and put my flag in 25, 35 years ago, I never would have dreamt that a man would walk by through the valley and look me in the eye, and his name was the mountain. Hmm. Half Thor Bjornsson, six foot nine and 420 pounds, almost 100 pounds heavier and six, seven inches taller, and, and there he is. Uh, so he's climbing the mountain and is now on top as the world's strongest man. Could he be the best ever? If he gains another 20 kilos, he'll put numbers out of sight, I think, for everybody, and he'll be mechanically fit to lift really heavy weights. Mm. Uh, with what he did to Brian Shaw recently, it could be a career ender for him. Mm. Because Brian was beaten on the deadlift platform, one of his best lifts, at the Arnold by Half Thor. And when he did that, you could have taken the Hindenburg and stuck it with a knife and lit a match. Poof! Something went out of him that I saw just escape into the room, the ceiling. Really? It's as if he was deflated. deflated. And now when I saw him at World's Strongest Man, he came in with a lot of fire, piss and vinegar, hmm. feeling good. And then there was a time towards the end of the event he was staring off to space. And I couldn't understand because there were a couple of events going to go. He probably could have still won. But the jet propulsion was not there. He, as he stared off into space, I don't know where he was, a million miles away. Hmm. He wasn't in the here and now. And I'm hoping, love the guy, for wins. I'm hoping that he can get it together and get back to the level that he's going to need to to catch up to Half Thor Bjornsson. Yeah. Because Half Thor is strong, overhead, pulling, uh, pulling with his arms, pulling with a harness, uh, pulling on a bar, uh, lifting overhead, and everything. He's, he's, and he's fast, great with the stones. He's so well rounded, I don't know how he can be beaten. Hmm. Uh, and thinking about Zadrunas Savickas and his fourth, <clears throat> for two years now, he's battling injuries and came into both of the World's Strongest Man competitions. And didn't do what he expected to do. He surely made the finals, but not much more. So it is kind of a shame to see the, the greatest of all time mm. uh, to just sort of stumble and, and you know, not be at his best. Right. Yeah, you almost wonder if he's got to find that uh, belief outside of himself that, that you attributed some of your success to. Well, I think Z is really happy to be where he is right now and wants to still compete and mm. enjoy it the game. Heck, when he tore his patellas off, he was told he'd never walk or squat again. And I think he's proved some people wrong. Yeah. He and I have had this argument many times as to who's the strongest man in the history of the world. Mm. And it's, I'll make it simple. Imagine two boys, eight years old, in the garden, backyard, a uh, big wooden fence, and they're, in a, they're best friends, but they're in an argument. Because each one tells the other one that he's the best. Z says, Kaz is my favorite. I go, Z's my favorite. He's did this and this and won the Ifses, won the Arnold, won everything. And he goes, yeah, but you were world's strongest man and world powerlifting champion, world record holder. And they stopped inviting you. You're the best. And they, uh, I don't have that same conversation with Brent Shaw. And uh, now maybe I can start to have one like that with Half Thor, who's winning. Mm -hmm. But when Z tells you that you're the best and his favorite, and it's vice versa. It's a thing of respect where it doesn't matter who's the best. Right. Where he's still competing. He may not be on top of the world anymore, but he's had a, a long and unbelievable career and uh, should s surely be saluted. If Eddie Cohn was the greatest powerlifter of all time, hmm. there's a new guy in the block. His name's Ray Ray Williams. He's going to squat 1,100 pounds. He'll bench press over 600 and he has the world total record raw already. I'm sure he'll get up over nine in the deadlift. Eddie Cohen, nothing against, nothing taken away from him. Really the GOAT in powerlifting. Yeah. Built perfectly for it. Did some incredible lifts. Uh, and he's my friend. Hmm. And there's mutual respect. 
He's a great guy, and he teaches other people. He's a bit like myself. He's a Johnny Appleseed of strength and fitness Absolutely. in the physical culture all around the world. And to actually have walked the walk and now talk the talk and teach to others, it's probably the greatest gift that we could have, that we are the kind of people that literally are selfless, not selfish. Hmm. And that our greatest joy is watching other people excel and become better to the point where they hit their own PRs. They become great. They become the best on their quest. Yeah. And that's truly rewarding. I enjoy it from kids 8 to 80. Yeah. And growing the sport that you love, right? I mean, that's got to be a huge part of it. Well, it's all the physical culture. And I think it's it's anybody who wants to do something, they'll just figure out an apparatus, find the weakest link, uh, capitalize on their strengths, bring up their weaknesses, get into a balance, but then also enjoy the the grind and and the, the lifestyle and the journey Mm -hmm. and be happy along the way. Sure. You know, I I think there are three things that are really critical for most people on a day-to-day basis and in their lives. Those three things are fun, happiness, and joy. I would challenge people to try to be, have fun every day, wherever they go, have a smile on their face and they'll be so much happier, healthier. But to have the happiness, our life has something, peaks and valleys. And within those, at the peaks, maybe we pinch ourselves and go, yep, I'm happy. Yeah, I've had fun every day. And then the valleys, we go, well, although things aren't going that good, when one door closes, two doors open, and I'm going to find true joy in my life. And for myself, my son was married a couple years ago. Our families, we all came together, and they were so, they had so many smiles. I wish them those three things, fun, happiness, and joy. And joy for the families at that moment in time uh, were all through the room. We might hit another point like that when he has a child and they bring a grandson or daughter into the world. Right. So. Yeah, it's like you got to keep that perspective through it all and that, that helps you weather the storms, right? I believe that in the balance and really have expectations. You know, what is it you want out of life? You have to know. What, is, what do you want for your sports career uh, and your own sports performance? But then again, your education, your world travels, yeah, right. your family. Uh, what, you wanna, what do you want to acquire? How much can you take with you? If you came in with nothing, you're going to leave with nothing? Is it the man who dies with the most toys wins? I don't think so. Hmm. I think it's the man who dies with the most wonderful memories of changing other people's lives and enhancing those. It has much greater richness and probably a, a better chance of making it into <laughs> where you want to go. Land. <laughs> right. Right. Than just acquiring a bunch of uh, monetary stuff. <clears throat> so yesterday, oh, I, I, before we wrap up, yesterday you talked a little bit about an, your approach to the different strongman implements and the events. And I think it's something that our audience, regardless of their sport, can really get something out of. You talked about this idea of looking at it like a puzzle and cutting it up. Yeah. Uh, you take any event and take a picture of it and then realize that after you develop that picture, this is something from 50 years ago, you make it into an eight and a half by 11. And as a child, we played with puzzles. Mm-hmm. We had circles and squares and triangles and rectangles, and we, they all fit into the puzzle pretty well. Uh, and a puzzle for a lift, if it was a bench press, it might be low pec, middle pec, upper pec, front deltoid, inner outer tricep, brachialis, latissimus. Well, we know the brachialis of the forearm is probably not that involved, but it still has some relevance to powerlifting form and bench. Hmm. The rhomboids and lats, believe it or not, the scapula, have a lot to do with a big, heavy bench. Uh, maybe not as directly as low pack, middle pack, upper pack, front deltoid, and tricep. But if you take each piece of that puzzle and you work on it, and you, you analyze the critique and understand its relevance, you then put it back into the puzzle and use it as a unit. And you realize, yeah, I'm finding some weaknesses. You know, the weakest link in a chain is, is usually, you know, that point that you have to fix. Mm-hmm. So then you, you use it and take it back apart, work on it, then put it back together, take it apart, put it together. In that process, you will find uh, your weaknesses and your strengths. And it's sort of a progression in a way to get from where you are to where you want to go. Yeah. It seems like that's how you get to mastery too, right? Same once you do it enough times, once you put something together enough times, you start to figure out how it works. Yeah, I would imagine it would be like when you're um, putting together one of your black rifles right. and you're blindfolded and you strip it down and put it back together in a minute and it's in complete darkness yeah but it becomes rote memory and there's something to be said for the subconscious mind because right now we're using our conscious we're thinking and talking and communicating most of us and all that we're doing most of us most of us <laughs> <laughs> but the subconscious mind it's taking care of our pulmonary our respiratory our cns 
And it's pretty automatic. Right. How do you control it? You probably can't unless you use hypnosis, uh, the motion picture of the mind, hmm. uh, a mantra. If you say that 10,000 times, I can, I will, I can, I will, I can, I will, you are now empowered. If you visualize and see something again, you have done it. You just see it and do it hmm. after you've seen it in your mind. But to actually uh, repeat again and again and again, that's something so important. One of my uh, simplest analogies would be this. You take a picture of Bill Pearl and you look at it and you see this unbelievable structure of shoulders, arms, lats, ripped thin waist with huge legs. A man who competed on stage at 53 years old against Frank Zane, Franco Colombo, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lou Ferrigno, and all the top guys looked better than any of them. Uh, one of the greatest mentors of, of the physical culture. So when you look at him and look at his picture, if you blink your eyes 10,000 times, each time having a new glimpse at what you want to look like, eventually, over time, if you do that enough and you look in the mirror at your own physique, you probably can see the same thing. But you're able to then, the function there is to drive it to your subconscious mind. Right, figure and, out where you need to put in work to get there. Yeah, and, and getting, you know, your, your conscious mind can say, yeah, I want this, I want it, but to do all the things that are necessary to become that and for it to become you, to have a great physique and great strength and power, uh, takes convincing yourself that it is, on a day-to-day -day basis, the singularly most important thing that you're about to do. Mm -hmm. And if something is a big enough priority and, and you want it bad enough, chances are you can do it. I think our society is, is falling off track in a way that, you know, it's, it's I want, I'm empowered, give it to me now. Uh, I expect that to happen overnight. Right. One of my favorite analogies and stories is I trained with Dorian Yates in the Forum Gym in Birmingham, England in those late 80s. And Dorian was massive. Man, he was, what a house. And the weights he used were incredible. A month, six weeks before a show, he could hardly fit through the door. So he did this bicep routine, and I watched him do it a few times. He started around 20 kilos, touch more, and then worked up to 40 kilos. Hmm. He ran the rack. But when he got to the top, he didn't stop. He turned around and came back down. It was one giant set of probably close to 20 sets. And people would say, he wrote about it in the magazines, and people would write in and say, that doesn't work. I tried it. <laughs> I go, you tried it how many times? Once, twice? He perfected that over 7 to 10 years. So he understood that exercise, his bicep, and how to get the best out of them, and they were massive. Yeah. So it's really uh, understanding your body and, and you know how to get to where you are from where you from where you are. Right, yeah. Well, those people that wrote in, that's why they'll never be Frank Zane, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So the last question that I try to ask every guest, the Lionheart kicker is, <clears throat> and this can be about lifting, this can be about life, whatever you, whatever you want, really, based on all the experiences that you've had up until now, if you could give advice, and it were guaranteed everybody in the world would hear it, hopefully everybody will hear it because they'll listen to Lionheart Radio, <laughs> what would you tell people? Hmm. Extract your cranium from your anus, <laughs> clean the shit out of your eyes, get a great vision on what your quest is and what you want to do. Yeah. And then just go and do it. That's something we talked a little bit about yesterday at the barbecue. It's this idea that a lot of people think they know what they want, but... They're caught up in what they probably should want. They don't really have any idea what, what it is they really want. Yeah, I guess with all the the overstimulation that we have in our world, uh, it's pretty tough to decide just what avenue you want to take. Yeah. And I've run into some professor types that are so smart, they read a different routine every week, and they stay on each routine about a week, where they probably need to be on 12 weeks per routine, so you know they don't really have the patience to go through... Uh, the wonderful programs they want to put themselves on and they want to design and, and implement. Right. But, uh, yeah, you know, you could sit and give advice for an hour and, and 10 of those, and I appreciate the time, energy, and, and interest in what I have to say, but I'm not all that prophetic at times. You know, I just got done eating. I'm ready yeah. for a nap. Right. Want another workout. Yeah. Well, you're somebody that just gets the work done, and that's what people need to know. Well, yeah. Yeah. You, know. you see it and do it. That's how it works. So thanks for all you do with, with your podcast. I think uh, I'd love to be back on again. I hope, you, I hope I'm welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime, of course. So in the uh, show notes of this episode, we'll link up all of your products and your, your website that's coming out and all of that. I know you have a lot of products on the, on the line that are coming out. 
there are some that are coming up and you know the mission is really simple often when we travel around the world is to go into a community and leave it better than we found it and in doing that I'm trying to align myself with the highest quality products and services in the world so that when people would come to my site they go uh, if you want to be a Kazmonaut go check out the Kaz site and here's some stuff that will actually better you right. uh, huge profits probably not but uh, helping others most definitely for sure Bill Cosmer, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louaviv.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on sentences for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest.